This is a story about common people finding friendship and community through an uncommon thing. Through their eyes, we start with the Boston Bound Group, sharing with me the events that led up to the 2013 Boston tragedy. Yes, it was very close to, to where we grew up. It was, um, it was, the day started out like any other day, so it was still a very beautiful weather day and very exciting. And it was exciting for some of us that decided or didn't requalify or go back or choose to go back to run the marathon that year. We chose to help other runners. We had, there were a couple of us that, three of us in particular, that went out to Natick and met three of our fellow runners and jumped in and ran them into different points along the course. Um, some went all the way into the city and some went part way. So it was really fun to be part of the experience in a different sort of way. And it was, it was a wonderful experience until that point where we learned at the hotel that uh, people had been seriously injured and killed as a result of, of someone who ignited bombs and detonated bombs, I should say, there. And, and then Monday morning came. And like usual, we get ready, we get on the buses, we take that long ride out to Hopkington. And uh, it was a little harder on me out in Hopkington. We had a great time for the two or three hours waiting for the start. But my back got a little tight and things uh, got a little strained. And, and when I got to the starting line, I knew this wasn't going to be a good day. So um, Kristen and I were just leaving. We just turned off Boylston onto Arlington. So this was probably about three and a half, four blocks from the explosion site. And um, I remember we heard the first pop and didn't say anything. We were talking, but um, you know, it sort of caused us to pause. And then, um, and then, you know, it was, I guess, 15 or so seconds later, we heard the second pop. And, um, and it was uh, that, that time, you know, we both commented on it, and I can't remember which of us said, but it's something like, heck of a big bottle of champagne they're shooting off. I found Lisa at mile eight at the train station, and she ran with me. And I told her that I wasn't doing well, and I wasn't sure I was going to finish. And she reminded me of what my goal was for that day and that was to experience the finish. So as bad as I felt, she decided that instead of running 10 miles with me from 8 to uh, 18, she was going to stay with me as long as she could. I did get across the finish line, but she ran all the way to the finish and jumped over the barricades about 100 yards from the finish. I finished the race, walked back to the hotel, it's just a block or two from the finish. Went up to uh, went up to my room and was showering. And one of my friends who was running had something in Facebook, Facebook. that Janice saw. And um, one of our runners came in and she said that she had just finished the race. And she said, the strangest thing happened. I heard this explosion. She said there must have been a, a transformer that exploded or something. And it said, um, uh, Too loud explosions. I heard too loud explosions. I didn't know he was, I thought he was in San Francisco, because that's where he lived. I didn't know he was at the, at the thing. So, so I, so I, that got my attention. I thought, what's going on? Um, but I remember it was really, there was just this really odd moment, because it had just happened, and we were stepping onto the sidewalk in front of our hotel. We were staying at the Boston Park Plaza. And we saw a police officer there, and both Kristen and I said, you know, thank you for, for being here today. And he sort of looked at us and smiled and said, thank you. And, you know, probably seconds after that, he got a radio that something had happened. So I put the news on, and, and they said that, that at the, and we didn't hear it, even though we we're quite close. We didn't hear, the, and then there was another explosion. And that's when you know, it's like when the second plane flew into the, towers like the first one could have been a mistake and the second one is oh no I got um, um, text messages um, from friends saying are you all right we heard about the explosions so we turn on the TV and um, so I text Chris and I said guess what that wasn't champagne we heard and she wrote it, our messages literally crossed we were right next door to each other um, but you know we'd realized that we'd actually heard the explosions that it wasn't actually champagne so when we were a couple blocks away, we were right at the end of the shoots in, in the, one of the Back Bay hotels there in uh, our group. And when Harry came running in with the news, he'd been upstairs. Harry had gone up to his room and he saw it on the news. And he came down and he got off the elevator 
and you could just see the look on his face. I, I, I had been at 25 and a half up to kind of the four hour people that we coach and had walked my way back and just through timing. It was actually indoors when the bombs went off, so I didn't even hear it. In fact, a lot of people even outside didn't didn't notice they were just a couple of blocks away. But And he said, hey, you all, there's been some bombings. There are people that are dead. we got to find everybody. I get dressed right away, and so we better go down, down to the lobby because that's where we knew all our friends were gathering. And I figured that they would have known about it by then, but I walked in the room, and everybody was still kind of involved in animated conversation and talking about their races and stuff and um, so I can't remember exactly what I said but I know I said something about Mark did you, did you know what happened when he came screaming into the room my god oh my god you know he said you're not gonna believe what happened I honestly by the look on his face and with the fact that he was almost crying and he, he, he was calling out so much to him, he, he, he interrupted. We were all in the room digesting the marathon, starting to, you know, we do it's a post marathon, you know, kind of review how to go, what went wrong, what went right. And he comes running in. I, I honestly thought that it was is something like the president had been killed. It, it was that kind of feeling. And I remember Mark, Mark told me later on, he said he could tell just by looking at me that I wasn't kidding around. This was something really serious. In fact, he said, he said, I thought you were going to tell me that the president was shot. All of us admit later on, we weren't sure where this was headed. You know, if there were six bombs or five bombs, were, were the hotels next? And people were saying, oh, there's, there's bodies everywhere. Hundreds have been killed. And, you know, um, we weren't, we were scared. And uh, he said, no, there's, there's bombings going along. People have their legs blown off because we, we knew that. And we didn't know how many. We didn't know if it was runners. We had no idea what was going on, but it was going on a block or two away, and they were telling everybody to stay inside. Because um, uh, we didn't know, would there be a third, would there be a fourth? We didn't know what was going to happen. She said, you're not going to believe what happened, you're not going to believe it, have you heard? And I was like, everything just stopped. And it feels like the next four hours were like in slow motion. It was like the earth stood still. Because I was right in the middle of a conversation with a woman who was, she was actually in tears about her race. And I was kind of consoling her, trying to figure out, okay, is this my coaching? Did we something go astray? And you're in that kind of mode, which is a little more selfish mode. I'm being selfish, worrying, gee, was it my coaching? She's worrying about her event. And it stopped. No one talked about their race for days. Lucky for us, everybody had made it in with no trouble. And blessedly spared any kind of direct I involvement with it, but um, just to, you know, feel that, I mean, to have been there on that street when it happened, and then just to, have, you know, the consequence, and just wondering about, you know, where is everybody? It was deeply personal, it was deeply sad, um, and at the same time, there was an element, after getting sad, to be determined that we would come together and help each other out and support each other in getting through the experience. I mean, and if you could have seen how quickly everyone just went into the mode of, are we okay? And let's let's make sure we're okay. By happen chance, my wife and I met this special Boston-bound group at a coffee shop in Charlottesville, Virginia. Their passion for the Boston Marathon was unmistakable. Our imagination was captured, and shortly thereafter, they agreed to allow me to follow them around with cameras over the course of two years, from the track to the finish line of the 2012 Boston Marathon. So Patriots Day in Boston is a holiday um, celebrated for lots of historical reasons, but for most of us it was a day off from school, a day off from work, and it was the day of the Boston Marathon, so it was a very big deal in our community uh, and all the surrounding communities on the course of the Boston Marathon. We got very excited and there was often um, parties prepared and barbecues and picnics and such. Um, you'd find a lot of people on their rooftops. Hello. Are you telling Paula she's going to do great tomorrow? You're going to be great, brother. Thank you. I'm going to need you. Daddy, Daddy, we have the same hair. Okay, there you go. Businesses would, would shut down, and uh, so consequently those that had to stay open, like banks and other businesses, most of the employees would get on their roofs and watch 
the course and watch the runners come through and it was a very very exciting thrilling day you would see people like Bill Rogers and as a kid growing up for me and learning about the Boston Marathon and what it was like for these runners I would go out and we would make sure we were out there at the point where we knew they would be coming so we were at mile 16. We've got this ritual of things that we do. It's a convention for runners. Yeah, it's a People convention he knows for on, runners. In the internet all over the country he gets to and meet we, them. Yeah I have friends all over the country and from other countries that I get to see. We go back and visit with our family. We have lunch every day with one of my good buddies from uh, from high school. We have dinner every year with Janice's roommate from when she was in Paris. Mm -hmm. There are just these rituals that we do that make it a holiday kind of thing over about five days. So we got a Charlottesville 10 miler one. That's probably Janice's. I'll bet because she did that. No, I wouldn't have. Oh, the one hanging on the Yeah, shop. yeah, I oh, bet yeah. that is. Yeah, that was here's, um, here's the Austin Marathon I did in 2007. Mardi Gras Marathon, that was in New Orleans, that was the first major um, athletic event that went on there after the, uh, after the hurricane, we did that. This is the Bay State Marathon in, uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts, that's where I first qualified for Boston. Here's the Austin uh, Marathon medal for the very first marathon that I ran. This is Mobile, Alabama. Uh, it's the first time I ever ran a marathon under uh, four hours. There's a Charlottesville Marathon one. I did that the, the first year that they that they had that. Oh, and there's my in the middle and the centerpiece is, is the Boston Marathon medal for the first time I ran it in 2009. And the Boston Marathon now is that's like the cycle of my life. I think I think that's 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 what I work for in my training all year round. It's everything's building up to that, and that's the test, and it's a celebration, and then when you get it done, it's turning the page onto the next year, the next cycle of my life. I mean, it's a, you know, somebody measures their life out in coffee spoons, I measure out my life in Boston Marathons. I lived in Boston in the 70s for a couple of years, and always loved that city, and to me, it changed in the the downtown area, but the Back Bay area, it was, it was the same as it was in the 70s. Great shops, great streets, beautiful brownstones. I think it's a, it's a really special atmosphere. And I, I do think some of, it, some of that has to do with the city. It's a really special city. I mean, it's, it's accessible. It's, um, it's very safe feeling, despite what happened this year. It's a, it's a very um, comfortable urban setting. It's historic. Um, there's a sense of history as you walk around. There's not as many modern buildings as there are old, a lot of old churches, a lot of neat old parks, a lot of brownstones. And so uh, I think that part of it right away puts you in the mode. I was going to come in here on Sunday, Thanksgiving weekend, get a little quiet yeah, time, yeah, and clean it off and take a couple hours. <laughs> see my. Uh, I see him doing that, my, you boy. I keep that there because that picture still offends a certain generation of people. But that was part of my 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 cutting mm -hmm. my teeth, rooting well, for sports. Good. That was a big big grab. moment in the history of the Olympics. Yeah, this is this is my life back here. Uh huh. Somebody just gave this to me for my birthday, Bob Johnson. A stand, an autograph Stan Musial card. Stan the man. I'm a big Cardinals fan, so big St. Louis Cardinals fan. Big Tintin fan, as is Steven Spielberg, who's bringing a movie out at Christmas. Adventures of Tim Tim. The Boston Marathon, I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible event. It's far from my favorite run, but in terms of my favorite event, you know, it's, 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 there's no question about it. But that has as much to do with the people and just the build up and the specialness of the time. And, um, um, you know, that's, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd almost rather run any other marathon in the world if it's just about the running, but about the, the actual event. There's nothing that beats Boston. Um, and so these up here are um, the, the posters that you get at the expo. Um, and they um, are, I've got actually all four years of the years that I've run. Um, people who get these posters actually know that your name is in here somewhere, and so you have to look very fine. This very faint um, text. Um, everybody who um, registers for the marathon is actually um, represented in these. And the fun thing after the marathon when you get home with all of your stuff is to lay it out on the kitchen table and try to find your name. Um, and I have found it in all of them. 
Up here um, is just a replica. Somebody took a photocopy, so it's not an original, but these um, are the uh, posters that they put up along the way um, uh, throughout the, the course um, that you know, let you know, uh, par uh, you know the people who live in, in, in along the course that they can't park or, or stop their cars there. Um, and they're kind of fun. It just, it's just something that you see so many of. Um, and even though um, you don't really get to stop and enjoy them when you're running, it's, it's, it's fun. And just uh, uh, Paula gave me that. And just a really neat reminder. When I decided I was going to run a marathon, I was to run Boston. And my goal was to run Boston. That's even though it's still a goal. What drives me is knowing that I've got these great friends that are almost like family to me and will be there forever. There is something special about knowing you're with people that have all work driven themselves towards this goal. But to know that you've all qualified, um, there's something neat about that and that, that feeling that, um, you know, we've arrived at something that's very unique. Yeah, to me, growing up in New England, Boston was always a big race. And when I lived in Boston for a couple of years and went to the finish line and watched all of these people coming across, I really wanted to run Boston. Of course, I wasn't a runner. <laughs> I wasn't interested in training, but I wanted to run Boston. And after I moved away from Boston, that, that thought left me. But when I started running again, you know, Boston came back in that, in that fullness. As I spent more time with the runners, I discovered there was a common thread that ran through all of their stories. I'd look in the paper and I'd see people my age dying of a heart attack, you know, cancer. Uh, my father had some health issues. And so all of that was like a sort of a, a wake up call to get fit. So then my goal became I'm going to do a marathon. Before by the time I'm 50. So I started training with my friend and we would run every day and um, I kind of thought we knew what we were doing except that I got to the point where I couldn't walk. You know, I hurt so much. Then we <laughs> those are gloves and hats. <laughs> uh, tights. <laughs> for the wintertime runs. I think these are rain jackets. Yeah. Rain jackets and shoes. I've just weeded out a bunch. I just took about five pair to Ragged Mountain. What are each shoe for? These are racing shoes. These are my winter shoes because they have screws in the bottom for ice. These are everyday shoes. And then actually my newest ones are in the, in the bedroom. I haven't put them in there yet. Um, I usually have about three or four pair going. I don't think, I don't know what's in here. Oh, sweatshirts and fleeces. That's it. That's it. I ran like a little bit, like up to a few miles, a few times a week just as part of being fit. But then on my 50th birthday, I decided that I wanted to run a marathon. I, I had thought about it before for, for a long time, but just kept putting it off, thinking I'll do, it, I'll do it some other time. But then when I turned 50, I thought, you know, this isn't going to get any easier. If I'm going to do it, I better do it now. So I went out that day on my birthday, and I went to Barnes & Noble, and I bought this book. It was Hal Higdon's book about how to train for a marathon. And I saw in his book that if you're in decent shape to start off with, you could train to finish a marathon. Not run it fast, but finish it in 16 weeks. So then I went and I looked at the calendar and I found out what date was 16 weeks out. And then I went to my computer and I started looking for a marathon that was gonna be 16 weeks from then. And I found one in Austin, Texas and I registered for it. Again, I think it was, it was that day. And the next day I just started training just all by myself. I didn't know anybody else that ran it. I had no idea about other runners in the area. I didn't know anybody. I just followed what this guy said to do every day. And um, 
So, and, and that was the first race I ever ran. I never ran any shorter race. The first race I ever ran was the uh, was the Austin Marathon in uh, 2003. It was February 2003, 16 weeks after my 50th birthday. My daughter talked me into running the 10 miler, signing up 30 days before it started, and. Uh, I ran a few threes, a couple of fours, a five, a six, and an eight, and I ran the 10-miler, and I thought I was going to die. And after running a, a pretty good 10-miler, two weeks later, I ran a half marathon and thought, well, if I double it, I can qualify for Boston. So, I, you know, I guess I'm going to run a marathon now. You know, just it, it was all pretty exciting, and it was the culmination of everything when I was, that I was training for. You were scared. Was I? Okay, I was scared. Uh, yeah, so was yeah, I. I yeah. I mean, dead. yeah. Can, you, can I can I do this thing? I just didn't know if I could uh, if I could do it. And again, I didn't even think about pace or time or anything else. It's just, can I keep running for 26.2 miles? The the longest I had run was was 20 miles. I mean, we grew up in Boston, so I mean, the Boston Marathon was always kind of lurking in the background, and I knew that was a big deal. I didn't think there was any possibility I could ever qualify to run to run that. I, I didn't know exactly what the times were, but I knew it was faster than I would expect to run. When Cynthia and I first got married, she's coming out of college, finish, finishing a collegiate career. It was the first time ever the International Olympic Committee had voted and they were going to allow women to run the marathon in 1984 in the Olympics. And the timing was perfect because Cynthia felt pretty strong and she wasn't done. Her scrapbook, uh, so to speak, wasn't filled up yet, and you know some unfinished business with her running. And I, I, a firm believer in no regrets for athletes. You know you don't want to be saying would have, should have, could have, 20, 30 years after the fact. So she, uh, she said, I'd like to try this, and, uh, um, and so I started coaching her. She had you know, never college coach anymore. And of course, the college coach wasn't coaching in the marathon, and I had zero experience other than being a runner myself, and. She won her first marathon, you know, Marine Corps Marathon, and I, you know, from that point forward, I b began to really um, uh, focus more and more, less and less on my own personal running, and more and more on, you know, teaching and guiding and advising and coaching and helping others to either get started with running, um, very much like what you've been through in, in Laura, or all the way up to, you know, trying to get to the Olympic trials. It was a case of almost there. I missed qualifying for Boston by two minutes and six seconds. So right after uh, the second Richmond, or the second marathon, which was Richmond, uh, I got together with Mark and he said, you know, shoot for national in March. He said, you'll definitely get there. Somebody encouraged me to go see Mark Lorenzoni, and I did, and I went in and introduced myself and showed him the program that we had been doing, and he said something like, well, you fool. <laughs> This is for a, an 18-year-old, and you're 50. So he started red slashing my program and uh, got me on the right path. So I made it to Richmond, my first marathon, and did that in four hours. And with his help on the second one, I knocked it down to three hours and 30 minutes, or give or take a minute or two, I can't remember exactly. And. Um, was on my way to Boston and really didn't know, I, you know, I'd probably heard of the Boston Marathon, but didn't know the magnitude of it and uh, that's how the Boston Bound group got started. It was just about three of us there at Ragged Mountain saying, let's train for Boston. Look, this is the one I didn't finish, but he said I deserved it anyway. I don't know, 89 degrees. Awesome. <laughs> Oh, this was my first Boston. Heidi, I, Heidi was shake and I was bake. Oh. Shake and bake. <laughs> so that would have been my first Boston. One of the things that really pushed me was I would go to Greenberries on Wednesday mornings after doing my workout, and on the other side of the the uh, coffee shop was a group of seven to ten people every Wednesday, and they were the Boston group. And I sat there and I looked at them every Wednesday and I said, pretty soon I'll be sitting with you. And that was my goal. Mark kept saying, join the Boston group now. I said, no, not until I qualify. These are some of the best friends I have and probably some of the best friends I'll have for the rest of my life. 
kids table or um i kind of was in it was an interesting because i was one of the one i would train with them but then let them run their long runs i was a short distance runner and they'd do their long runs and, uh, and i knew a lot of them because we'd finish races about the same pace so and then i just kind of just kept going to the they'd like oh come to the long runs so i came to the long runs and somehow i was in the group it was before it was really big it was it was still we everyone would email everyone by name so yeah there were about i guess 15 of us at that point when I moved to Virginia in 1999, um, I was for a short period of time not affiliated with um, a university, and there just aren't a lot of places to swim without paying, you know, just ridiculous monthly fees um, for these athletics clubs. So I started running a little bit then. Uh, about five or six years after that, I started having problems with my shoulder, and I needed to let off the swimming a little bit just to let my shoulder heal. And a friend of mine in Richmond actually um, convinced me to go running with her. And at the time, I just thought, well, you know, it's something I can do now and then. But, you know, it doesn't require much more than just shoes. Um, you don't need a membership. Um, you know, they, they're not going to close the streets for a, you know, a swim meet or something like that. It was, just, it, was, it was just available all the time, and I liked that a lot. But this is one um, that Kristen gave me after the marathon. Um, we will finish the race, it says, with um, you know, hundreds of shoes um, forming a heart. Uh, and this is really, you know, just to remind us why we do it and that even though um, Boston 2013 was not um, the perfect Boston, um, it's still very special in many ways and, and it will continue to be special. Then somehow I, f I found out about the Marathon Training Group that, that Mark Lorenzoni coaches um, and the uh, Charlottesville Track Club runs. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try this. So that was the first time I ever ran with anybody else, ever trained with anybody else. And I went to Mark and said, I want to qualify for Boston. You think I can do it? And he looked at what I'd done in the past and said, yeah, I think it's within reach. And so he wrote out a program for me. And, uh, and I went through the training. And that fall, I went to the Bay State Marathon in Lowell. I mean, I, if you'd asked me six years ago today, will you ever run a marathon? I'd say, no, absolutely not. There, there is no way that I can do one thing for that long without some sort of a relief. I mean, I'm the kind of guy that can't sit through a two-hour movie without getting up and fidgeting. And the idea that I could just dedicate myself to something like that for, you know, three or more hours just was insane. And I'll tell you, I've run now not just marathons, but ultra marathons, and not just ultra marathons, but I've actually done a 50 plus mile race. I have run for 10 and almost a half hours, 54 miles in the mountains. Um, yeah, it shaped me. And, um, and I qualified for Boston. But that was about my seventh or eighth marathon before I did it. Then after I finished the marathon, I went to see Mark to tell him I qualified. And he said, well, you know, so if you want to keep doing this, so you're going to run Boston now that you're qualified. So I got a group of, of people that, that train to run Boston. He said, you could, you could train with them. The goal for all of us, I think, or, or for the most of us, is just to be together. A lot of people say that they hate racing. What they love is the training. And they love the training because of the camaraderie. I can't even remember one. It's probably about... Um five years ago, um, no, six years, pushing six years ago. And I had no idea what to expect. And um, somebody had told me about the, you know, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if you qualified for Boston um, on your first marathon? And, you know, going into a first marathon, and by the way, I was largely self-coached. I had friends that I ran with, but I didn't really have, you know, somebody like Mark. I went out, you know, started running my first marathon and, um, you know, quickly found out I was going to be running a, a, a pace it was very close to qualifying for Boston and I came within about eight minutes of qualifying for Boston and of course when you're that close to something that everybody in the world thinks is really cool all of a sudden it becomes incredibly cool to you and so um, I you know after that first marathon I thought shoot I can shave off eight minutes and um, and so I set that as my goal and um, in fact uh, about four marathons later I mean it took me that long I think if I would run a 350 as opposed to a 328 um, you know, something that was more like 30 minutes away from my um, qualifying time. It wouldn't have been a passion, but that I was so close, um, you know, on my first time really kind of cemented in my, in my mind as something that I really wanted to do. And when I started running with people in Charlottesville and, and just got to see the, you know, the, the group that is the Boston Bound group and, you know, the friendships that had formed and the fun that they had and all that. This isn't just Boston, but 
These are all but one of the races that I've run. I lost one um, uh, race bib. Um, uh, other than that, everything that I've done is there, and, um, and then all of the races that Jay has run. So we've got the Boston 5K that Jay runs, and um, then the Boston Marathons, various places through here. I'm not finding one right now, but it's interesting. Yeah, here's a, um, oh, this is also a 5K. This is a Boston Marathon. Here we go. Yeah, and so they're all there, but also 10Ks and various other things, the 10 mile or um, even my ultras are in there. The Boston Bound experience is about family. It really um, is about a family of, of friends who have come together with a common purpose, which is to train and run any and all possible marathons but with the hope and singular goal of qualifying and running Boston because of the prestige associated with that particular event um, that people really would like to um, see that dream realized. They hear about it, they've seen, they've read about it, but to actually experience Boston is, can be a once in a lifetime experience for some, for some folks. So they train very hard for it. So Boston Bound in Charlottesville is a really cool way of bringing um, I feel another layer of family together. So he said, okay, we said, well, uh, you just sit tight and uh, in the next few days you'll get an email from Heidi Johnson. She said, she's the captain of the team and she'll tell you what to do. And so that's how I started running with the Boston group and trained with them over the winter of 2008, spring of 2009 for my first Boston Marathon in 2009. But what's amazing about it, I think, um, is your aging, I mean, you are no kid anymore, no matter whether what? you start when you're 30s, 40s, 50s, <laughs> whenever you start. Um, and But it's quantifiable. You're getting better. Yeah. You're getting faster. You're getting better. And you're getting older, which is an amazing thing. So, you, so it's like, how far can I push this? Yeah, in a way, I'm a freak of nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how, how many years, how many years passed uh, um, between your first marathon in Boston? It was, uh, what was f about five, five years. Yeah, it was about five years before I qualified for my first Boston. Oh, how I love a good cup of coffee amongst friends after a brisk run. This is us right before going to Boston. I just ran with those guys. Pretty fast for some old dudes. <laughs> They're like twice my age. So out here this is one of their recovery days last day before Boston I think it was an eye-opener I'm 27 years old and these guys could run circles around me um, this is number this is my third Boston and it's number 11 marathon your 11th marathon? 11, yeah. So what are you looking for this time around? Um, well, <laughs> I'm looking to have a very good Boston. I have a, I have a goal time of uh, about three, 3 hours and 23 minutes. Mm -hmm. But more than that, I just want to have a really good Boston experience. I, my last two have not been so good and um, it's, a great, it's a great race. It's, very, uh, it's a very mental race um, and it would be nice to actually um, enjoy and feel good at the end of it. Um, but I do have a full time of 323. Kristen and I are going to be running it together, so I think um, part of the goal is for us to just have a really great day together. Okay. Awesome. Hard, yeah. So why did the last two go up? Uh, I was injured last year, and um, and then it was it was just really hot, and I just don't do that. Well. Um, and the year before that, I, I still don't know what it was. Um, the 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 race starts at ten, and we all get up at you know four thirty at five and run at five thirty, and and we um, we so we don't run long runs at ten o'clock in the morning, and and that. Um, it's sort of the digestive cycle is a little interrupted, not to get too specific, but um. <laughs> So the, the Boston group, how'd you get hooked up with those guys? Oh gosh, that didn't come until after I had run a bunch of marathons, probably about eight or so. I kept, after I finished the first one, I really liked it and I wanted to keep doing it. You looked like death warmed over after oh, that first Oh, yeah, I was, it was hurting, it was terrible, but I wanted to keep doing it. Now, he'll run a marathon, and after he takes a shower, you know, he looks pretty good after you get rid of the shiny blanket and you take a shower, then it's like, you know, that you've watered a plant, okay. you know, he blossoms. Yeah. But man, after that first one, 
Yeah. It was bad. Ended up missing qualifying for Boston by 16 seconds. So, and then decided, you know what, I'm gonna qualify for that. And so my next one, I took off, I think 14 minutes when I ran the New York Marathon. And, <laughs> and qualified. So is this really a solidifying experience? I mean, what is, I mean, because you guys run together and you guys, I mean, you guys seem like. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, and really, I, I think most of us are in it, not to necessarily run the marathon, but because the training group is so good. It, it's just, so, yeah. 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 The marathon stinks. The marathon, it, it's going to hurt. It hurts. It's going to hurt. It's, it's all of the training. But the training runs, I mean, the things that come out at a couple, like 16 miles in, will keep you laughing for uh, the rest of your, your miles and, and then they do something they needle the other person about for a long time to come. You know? Yeah, as I said, my goal was to get with this group. You know, that's the reason that I ran and qualified for Boston because I wanted to be part of the family. And they didn't kick me out, which means you really are part of the family. They can't kick you out. Unless you start running slow. No, Mark told me. Once you're, you're in, once you're in, you're always in. Yeah, once you're in, it's hard to get on. That's right. And since, I, and, and since I control the list, yeah. you know, anybody gives me a hard time, they're out. We started off with individual email, and we can go back to it. That's right. So what are you guys most looking forward to? Uh, this 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 time around, that, the beer at the finish. The post party. Yeah. <laughs> what are you, Harry? The bubble tea? No, I'm looking forward to like the finish, standing up. I'm look smiling, seeing the finish line. To be truthful, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing the finish because I I didn't see the finish last year. I ran across it, but I was unconscious and don't remember anything. Wow. <laughs> It's a tough race, huh? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We quickly got acclimated to the fun that is Boston. Before the big race, the runners broke bread and prepared for the big day. I am. I'm actually, you know, it's uh, the, the one thing I don't like about marathon running is heat. Yeah. And so tomorrow I get lots of heat, which means I'm going to learn to like it, yeah. and I'm going to learn to work with it. And it's not going to be my best day ever, yeah. but you know what? I'm going to finish and I'm going to finish strong. And I'm so are you, really excited are you visualizing getting across that finish? Oh, seeing I, these I'm people? already across that finish. I'm visualizing doing smart stuff, taking it easy, and really having a great strong finish. I did this in Chicago, and it's a little worse this time around, but you know what? It's going to make it all the better. Awesome. Hey. This is the day before the race. Yes, sir. You got a good night's sleep last night, I bet, didn't I you? I get a good night's sleep every night. So you didn't lose. So you want you didn't lose any sleep last night. Nope. So what, what are you? What are your final? Well, today we've just watched the 5K. Very exciting race. Then next on the agenda is a brunch with the whole big running group, and words of wisdom from our coach. And then I headed back to the hotel room put my feet up on a stack of pillows and lay down for the rest of the day and usually have an early room service dinner, make my final preparations with my outfit and then go to bed, go to sleep. Go to bed. And there, there's a social aspect to it that I'm simply not willing to forego. Um, and you know, the dinner the night before is really a great time. But um, for me, marathoning, you know, it's, it's really about nutrition. Um, it's about a good night's sleep. It's about, you know, resting up well. Um, but it's also about, you know, feeling sort of at peace with the whole process. Here's Bob. Yeah, every time before I run. Last year, yeah. I'm just gonna stick with awesome. it. Awesome. Cool. Does. You got all your packets. You got everything lined up on your bed. You got your bib. It, it's been packed. I carried it onto the airplane because nothing was gonna get in the way of that. There you go. Awesome. Fast from here until about eight o'clock tonight. That's your cutoff. Yeah, I gotta sleep sometime. <laughs> It was never just about the race, but oh, what a sight to behold.
Boston Marathon means um, family, it means running, it means community. It's really about the people. It's about the connection of people, be it on the course and off the course. The connectedness of people in that community is incredibly proud and strong and vibrant. And everybody from the volunteers that help usher you through every point of the, of the process of getting on and off the course to all the family members and friends that are spectators filling those streets. It is a sea of people. It's a sea of, of, of joy, of pride, of, of, of athleticism. But more importantly, it's about connectedness and how people come together regardless of where their life experiences and circumstances are. Um, there's so many different people of different walks of life that come together on that one day on, in that special moment. It's Boston this city and the history of the city and the Charles and the villages you travel through and the hilly terrain and the starting time and the age of the race and the, the, the prize money and the, the great runners over the years that have won it, future Olympians, Joan Benoit, um, Bill Rogers. If you ask just about anybody that's trying to get there, it's got nothing to do with Boston versus what, what's the difference between Boston, London, New York, Chicago? I mean, that's kind of pretentious to say one city is that much better. It is a beautiful city. I love it. But that's not why, that's not what drives the inner spirit in people with this event. It's the fact that you're told you can't do it unless you run a certain time. We love that kind of stuff. We're wired that way. Cynthia always says this, and I think it's a good way of putting it, that they're used to the notion that if you work hard, you, you're, you're shown results. And that your work is worth something and, and you have something to show for it. Boston was a holiday of sorts, mixed with elite athleticism, joy, and the triumph of humanity. It's the last one left like this, and, uh, and as long as they keep those standards, you'll keep getting that, that feeling. And I think the marathoners there are obviously more experienced, so you, you get a slightly different kind of feel in, 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 in restaurants and out at the expo, and, you know, in the starting line and the spectators, they're, 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 they're saying more experienced things. I don't know how to put it, but they're not, you know, saying things like, oh my God, that person looks like this. I've never seen that before. Or they just, there is a certain um, amount of experience among the spectators too, because their spouses, coaches, friends, whatever, and they've been through this experience before with this person. Whereas you, the average American marathon now there's a good percentage of people on the starting line at any given time they've never run a marathon. But the feel, you could squint your eyes and say, this is 30 years ago, it's the same race. And I love that they haven't um, changed um, that atmosphere. What was your first Boston run? Awesome. It was like the most incredible experience, like um, just you, you can't imagine. It was just, I mean, I, I was so lucky to have people there that I, you know, that like Heidi Johnson, who had been to Boston many times, and I, I kind of like just latched onto her. It was like, don't leave me, whatever you do, you know, and, and it was just an amazing experience to see that many like-minded people that are there for the same reason basically you know you're talking close to 30,000 people who have whoever dreamed that there'd be that many people would run one race the anticipation was incredible the race went off and it seemed very easy especially with Paula giving me the tour of 26 miles, waving to her aunts and her cousins and her sisters and brothers. And we stopped at uh, her parents' place where they've been watching the Boston Marathon for who knows, 50 years or so. Heartbreak was uh, amazingly easy. But when I reached the top, I realized that I was starting to get a little tunnel vision around the edges. So tunnel vision closed in right about Mass Ave. But I saw the bridge, I got onto the bridge, but the next thing I remember was waking up in the medical tent. And I was absolutely devastated that I hadn't finished. So I asked him, did I finish? I looked, I didn't have a medal around my neck. Uh, totally dehydrated, 
They gave me uh, two IVs. I was in the medical tent for two hours. So they finally let me go and I'm walking back to the hotel thinking about the party that I've been missing and, and I walk in and the first person that sees me is Mark. And you know, I'm still bummed out that I didn't finish. And Mark sees me and he yells, Gaffney, I can't believe you finished. And I went, what? I finished? And he goes, yeah, and you ran a PR too. My, my mind initially, it was, I can't believe they're letting me do this. I think that was my, my first reaction to it all. Your thoughts at mile uh, 25.1, because that's where you kind of... Oh, it was horrible. My, yeah, my, my, first, my first Boston, I, I bonked at uh, about 25.1. Literally, this had never happened before. It came on all of a sudden, my legs just got floppy. And within a couple seconds, I just I collapsed on the ground. Before that, I was getting kind of a tunnel vision kind of thing where my thinking wasn't getting, my thinking wasn't clear. Literally, I was only seeing right in front of me. I wasn't even seeing the crowds on the side. Um, but I just, I just fell down. And I, and I remember hearing people say, get him off the course, get him off the course. I'm thinking, no way they're going to do this to me a mile away from finishing. And I get up. And uh, some woman um, kind of took me by the arm, and she said, "Well, she said I'll I'll walk with you." Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's finishing her own Boston Marathon, and she said, "Well, I'll walk with you." And uh, so she walked with me, and we walked until we got uh, till we got to uh, to Boylston Street. And Boylston Street is the finish, and probably about a quarter of a mile down or so, you could see the finish line. And, uh, and I saw that, and I was finally able to stop walk. I was able to get myself into kind of a slow jog, but I thought, I'm not going to walk across the finish line. I was going to get in a jog, and I got myself back together then. And I said, okay, go ahead now, I'll be fine. And... Um, and so I jogged through to the finish. And as it turned out, even with walking most of that final mile, it was the fastest I had ever run a marathon. I, I, I got a personal record by, I think, eight seconds. So if I hadn't jogged that last part, I wouldn't have done it. And I requalified to go back to Boston that year. And I so. tried to find out who that woman was by looking at the finish line pictures, and she had her jacket over her number. Yeah. I wanted to send her roses. <laughs> I would just say this was the, um, this is my fourth Boston, and this is my best, most fun Boston Marathon out of all of them. And it's also my slowest by more than an hour. And it was definitely my hottest, but it was just a lot of fun. Um, I ran with Paula, and uh, after, just before we got to mile 10, we realized that it was a hot day, and it just wasn't, it wasn't going to happen in terms of speed, so we decided we would just make the, make the best of it. And uh, we took in all the sights, and had a lot of fun, and when we wanted to run through a little sprinkler and get wet, we did that, and we slapped a lot of kids' hands, and, uh, and, and I ran through Wellesley College. And we just made sure that we were ready. We had our chairs and our family members and friends and picnics and barbecues, and we'd get out there and we would cheer the very first runners on, and it was a very big deal because there were a lot of police officers and motorcades coming. And then we'd see people like Bill Rogers, and we'd see people like Joan Benoit, and Dickie Hoyt, and his son that he pushed in his wheelchair. And we would cheer and cheer and cheer to the point where there was very little space on the sidewalk because everybody was out there cheering these runners on. And we would be out there for hours. And it was great. It was a wonderful experience. Always with the Ryan family. Their ancestor, their grandfather, won the Boston Marathon 100 years ago this year. And they're all, 25 of them are running the race today wow. in memory of their their, their great-grandfather, whatever. Yeah, um, 25 of the descendants are running. 
name is Mike Lyon. This is the guy I won in 1912. It's the week the Titanic sunk. It was a That's what you call poetry in motion. I think back from my first Boston, I was just scared to death, nervous. Um, you know, like just afraid I was going to mess up. Um, but I'd been coached very well, and I sort of run with a plan. I've done that from the beginning, and I stick to the plan most of the time, and uh, it works. So I managed to do it and keep and qualified for the next one. What's that experience been like having Mark as your coach? Well, it's amazing. I don't know why he gives like he gives or how he does it. He's there basically for you every step of the way. I mean, he's you, you come around the turn at mile 25 and there he is with words of encouragement for you that get you down that last mile and, and uh, point two, which is the hardest part of the race. And How long have you been running? Seven years. So you're, is your story, do you have a typical running story or are you just kind of like a wonder dude? <laughs> yeah, I want, at the wonders, I wonder how I can do it. Um, no, I, I don't know. I just, I, you know, I just, I kind of give it all to Mark because he's a smart coach and, and I listen to him and I do what he tells me to do. Every medal you have? Um, except one I gave to Mark, my Chicago 10-10-10 when I gave, I and mean, I felt just like he got me there. I think it's at the store at Ragged Mountain. There's a few that aren't for marathons, there's probably a few that are littler races. She was with Kenny. She's nine miles in. Okay, she was with Kenny. 34.75. How are we looking, man? I was just saying that. Here comes another little corn husker. Go Huskers! Um, there's going to be so many different takeaways today, Amar, from this. Everybody's going to have their own little victories within their experience. Time is its the first time in, a, in for my only time I've ever been here where time, it, 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 the time you're shooting for, means nothing. It, it's, it's the time you ultimately get based. All right! Yes! Hot! Yes! Bill Potts. We just hold on the heat. So you just saw, and we're an example. It, everybody's going to have something positive to take away from this. Whether they decided to drop out, whether they decided to walk. Where they just ran slower, but not so terribly slow as what well. as long as they're feeling good at the, you saw how he felt. He looked great. He looked better than he did last time when he ran a lot faster. So they're smart. That's the thing I'm most proud of. They, 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 all of them behave, you know, they, 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 they use their smarts, their experience today. It was crazy. It was very thrilling and exciting. It was the most incredible feeling of sensation in terms of hearing and vision. You, when, when I got out there, I, I was practically weeping. I was just so ecstatic and excited and everyone was cheering for you. They were cheering because of you. They were cheering for you and with you. And it, there's a lot of American flags flying and a lot of people screaming and yelling and carrying on and supporting you and clapping you and high-fiving you and you get caught up in that joy and that mysticism that is all about Boston, which is considered the granddaddy of them all, the granddaddy of all marathons. So it was really, really thrilling. Here he comes! There's Jim! Go Jim! Go Jim! Go Jim! Go Jim! Attaboy, Jim! Go Jim! Attaboy! He did good! He did, he did good. really good! Well, the, the, the first Boston, and I, I suppose everybody's first time is very incredible, but uh, the first time, um, 
I mean, it's, it's the first time I've really felt like an athlete. I mean, I, I used to joke when I'd run 10Ks, and even when I ran my first marathons, that they'd say, you know, athletes only in the part that was set aside for the runner. They'd call it the athlete's village. Because I don't feel, I've never really considered myself an athlete. I consider myself somebody who's very concerned about fitness and who enjoys exercise. But the idea of being an athlete, just, you know, that's like those other guys. Those are the people who are really serious about it. Um, and I have to say, when I first went to Boston, I mean, um, we flew um, from Charlottesville or Richmond, I can't recall, but we flew through LaGuardia. And so it was a short flight from LaGuardia to Boston, but everybody there was going to Boston. I mean, that was pretty much their, you know, where they were flying to. And so um, you, would, you, you could tell that there were a lot of people just by the, you know, shoes that they were carrying or the real lean builds or the, you know, um, the, you, know you could tell there were a lot of marathoners there. And, um, the, um, the captain of the plane came on um, shortly after we took flight, you know, we were airborne and said, you know, um, and we want to, you know, give a special acknowledgement to all of our, um, you know, our, all of our Boston Marathon runners. I hope you have a really great race on Monday. And the whole plane, you know, erupted in applause. And it's like, wow, that's, they're talking about me. I mean, this is like, that's the first time I've ever had strangers spontaneously break into applause for something that I was about to do. And you know, that feeling carried all the way through. It's like they shut the streets down for us. Um, it was just a big party. Everybody, you know, here's a, here's a, um, a city that's literally being invaded by tens of thousands, well, hundreds of thousands of people probably when you count all the spectators and everything and they're shutting down streets and traffic's a mess and all the cops are, and you know, they couldn't be nicer and, and couldn't treat you any better. And even right to the end, I remember I, um, going back home, um, I went through um, TSA and of course, you know, you couldn't wear your medal because it's, it's metal, but, um, but I did have my finisher's jacket on and you know, TSA people are not known necessarily for being polite or friendly or engaging. And, you know, this gruff guy is checking everybody through and he sees my finisher's jacket and he said, so did you run the Boston Marathon? And I said, yeah. And he said, how did you do? And I said, I did great. And he's like, oh, good for you. You know, and just, for, you know, I mean, that's what it's about. That's cool. These are all my half marathons um, and other um, things like the Charlottesville 10 miler um, uh, are in here. And then these are actually all my marathon medals. I think I've run... Um, close to 20. I think it's maybe 18 if you count ultras at this point. So this was actually the marathon that I qualified for Boston, the Ridge to Bridge Marathon in North Carolina. And they, it's actually a handmade um, pottery medal, which I think is really cool. And then um, the Boston ones, they're all pretty, very similar. This is um, this, is this year um, and all the other years. But um, this is the Berlin Marathon, which is actually the marathon that I qualified for this year's Boston. I ran that um, in September, um, kind of a cool medal as well. And um, wine glass, one of my favorites. Um, it's actually pressed glass. Um, this is in North Carolina, or no, North Carolina, excuse me, in New York um, State, and just a really, really pretty medal. So that is where all the medals go, and I think that's my jackets I wear, so um, <laughs> they're not in any, any, any special place. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Are you mic'd right now? I am, but I can't. Well, if you can hit record, then we'll sync it. Although well, you just saw what went by. I was telling some of the people this morning I'm waiting with the bus. But one thing I do feel confident, confident about, one thing I feel confident about is you're smart. And you've learned so much over the last few years. And it's almost in a way that all that training and all that race experience has prepared them not to run fast today, but to run smart. And to be safe, and to be alert, and to be aware of your, what, what's happening around you. So you can at least either come out of the race, like Kenny did, smart, to, or slow down like a lot of the folks have wisely. That's what 25 miles and 89 degrees of heat will do to you. Oh my God. So what's happening there, Laura? He is slowly, slowly unraveling. His life is dissipating right now. Yeah! That's why 
it's good they got a medical person right next to him. Because if he goes down, he could hit his head. He has no control right now. Unfortunately, nothing. Are you, are you it's Hill. They should be running. We'll see them running together, Katie and uh, Captain Heidi. They're walking and pulling cramps, it looks like. <laughs> That ain't good right there. I can tell you this about marathon runners, because I'm never going to be one. There's an OCD thing running through. It's true. I mean, OCD can be a good thing. Uh, obsessive compulsive. Not really disorder. It's just like that's how they are. I was sitting around a table with a whole bunch of runners a couple years ago, and I was just getting to know them. And I said, okay, so who here alphabetizes their spices in their CD collections? And they're like, oh, yeah, I do that, I do that. That's, they love to um, uh, uh, be in control of everything. And when you run a marathon, you can be, there's, there's 26.2 miles, the weather changes, the terrain changes, your body changes. So what a challenge for every mile of that to have your Garmin and to know exactly how fast you're going and to figure that out. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's like a rolling uh, challenge. It's not just like, oh, I'm starting here and I'm going there. It's, I have to figure this out for every mile, every mile, such that I prevail and I do it faster than I did it last time. Tell me about 2012, the hot one. Um, that was a different kind of experience. Um, having had several Bostons under my belt, I wasn't so nervous. Um, maybe had too many under my belt because I got a little bit too sure of myself in the race and changed my race plan midstream, actually even before midstream, and um, it didn't it didn't work. I you know, I should have stuck to my plan and I didn't achieve the goal that I wanted to achieve. Uh, basically I went out, did a novice thing and went out too strong, especially on the downhills and sort of just blew my quads out and didn't have enough for the finish. So I was eight minutes off my mark. It was the first time I hadn't had a PR in a marathon, and that was a big blow to me. <laughs> Can you remember any thoughts you had right before the gun went off um, as you're like approaching the starting line? Oh, it's different every single time. Um, I mean, some of it, not to be scatological, is do I need to go to the bathroom one more time? I mean, that's, I think everybody has one of those. Um, you know, do I have everything that I need? There's that. But there's the first time, um, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. I was in the first wave, um, which is, you know, they start right at 10. And, uh, and you know, you've got the, the elites are just, you know, a few yards or a few hundred yards. I mean, the, the starting line is actually more like a, a long, long column of people that, you know, proceed over the, the, the starting line. But, you, you know, you're in line with them. And um, some fighter jets just screamed over overhead, you know, um, and, um, and then the commentator said something about, they're going to be in Boston in, you know, four minutes, and it's going to take, you know, the, the lead runners here another two hours beyond that to get there, you know, and it sort of puts it all in perspective. But, um, but I mean, it's just awesome, and, it, you know, there's, there's nothing like it. I mean, it, just being there and just the experience of being, you know, with the, you know, the elites, and even if you're not in the same wave as them, I mean, you're still breathing the same air. So, Mark, what was the worst case scenario today? Hold her hand. Well, of course, we Anwar, all the reports aren't in yet. But uh, I would say we came out ahead for the most part. Worst case, maybe Katie Ryan, and even there she was laughing. You got to see her. Then when she came up at uh, 25 and a half.
The real glory is being knocked to your knees and then coming back. That's real glory. That's the essence of it. Vince Lombardi. It didn't make me not want to run it. It didn't make me want to run it. I, I'm, I decided a long time ago, I'm going to keep running that race as long as it'll have me. I mean, immediately, the first thing I thought is, oh my God, I've got to come back next year. I mean, you know, we just you don't want to abandon this thing. But it really did feel personal. I mean, I'll say that if, you know, I mean, I, I think I, I get, I get more of how people in New York felt after 9-11. You, you know, you and Laura have been there and you know, I mean, that, that finish line, it's kind of hallowed ground. I mean, there's something very sacred about it in that it is a, and I'll tell you, when you're running it, it's, it's hallowed ground. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the bombings were an attempt to take away something sacred uh, to the runners and, and to the citizens of Boston and to America. Um, so you bastards! Yeah, yeah. We I mean, live here. How, how yeah, yeah, this? yeah. I mean, this is this was like our everybody, city. Everybody must feel it when yeah, that happens. This is our city. This is our race. Um, it was instantly um, shocking, and then it went from shock to determination that we were going to get through this and we were going to stick together and help each other out and support each other. Um, it was very, very painfully sad to see the people that were injured most were people who were cheering us on as runners. As tight as the marathon community is for the city of Boston, I think these events have just made those bonds so much tighter. And we never had a chance to go back. I mean, we never, you know, besides just running through, you know, there was never that sort of opportunity to kind of gather around it. And it was just one of the most frightening things to see, knowing that we just come across there, um, you know, not more than 20 minutes ago. Um, there were family members and friends. There were people that were spectators that were there, and their heart and soul was about cheering on their family members that were running perhaps for the first time. And now you hear this overwhelming chorus of people saying, I'm going to Boston next year, I want to be there. And Boston's strong and the Red Sox. And, and it will not be ruined by this. And yeah, yeah, In and fact, it'll be all the sweeter, you know, as yeah. life is when things go wrong. But it just in contrast, it makes things sweeter. People, it, 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 it's kind of like 9-11 in a much smaller way. It unified people and for you know, the interesting thing that comes out of a tragedy is there's a notion of peacefulness afterwards. You know, at least for me, you know, I would like to go back and sort of have that, that closure and sort of regain that sense of Boston as a wonderful place that it is. It's, it's a life journey. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a unique experience in one's lifetime that if they're able to realize it and you cross that finish line in Boston, it is one of the most uh, awe-inspiring events that you can ever realize. And for me personally, um, it's a, the culmination of lots of road work, lots of conversation, lots of people time, if you will, learning about how to better yourself as an athlete and as an individual. I think there are people in Boston that that day or the next day decided they would run the 2014 Boston Marathon and they would do whatever it's going to take to get in there. And I can't wait to see the people that were injured at the start of the race and the finish of the race being heralded and, and celebrated for who they are and for what they endured. This notion of Boston is so much more than it, the race. I think that's what it, it reminded me of at that moment in a graphic way that really when it's all said and done, it isn't about times, it isn't about how fast you can run. It's about relationships and the appreciation of, you know, us having um, the, the ability and the, the opportunity to be runners and to run in a group, to put one foot in front of the other because, of you know, you saw what happened to some of the folks. They lost limbs. And it just came down to really just being grateful, reflecting on what this experience is about. What was the takeaway from this? And to me, the takeaway is that, you know, the spirit is greater than the, the, the negative. When I'd be thinking, oh, I don't want to go out there, I was thinking of those people that suddenly didn't have a leg or didn't have two legs. Think, oh my God, imagine like, you, know, you wake up in the morning, you have to remember again that the, those people blew your legs off and say, I'm so lucky, I got everything.
why wouldn't I go out and run? And I found I continue to find that just very motivating just to get up and move and do it because why wouldn't you? Another journey begins. <laughs> Does it look like I have to pull my gun? No, Oh, 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 oh,